Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. Today's date is April 6, 2021, and today we're doing a twofer on libertarian stuff. We just did the libertarian statement of principles in the last video, and now we're going to look at Jimmy Dore talking to Max Kaiser hawking Bitcoin. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe and consider supporting us on Patreon. There's a link in the description to the Patreon. So as socialists, we're huge opponents of libertarianism, which overtly stands for unregulated free market capitalism, child labor, no minimum wage, on and on and on. At best, it can be conceived of as a sort of idealistic opportunism that tries within capitalism to provide a certain amount of civil liberties to workers. Of course, from a materialist perspective, we know that capitalism actually will undercut all of your economic standing and you know, render these civil liberties worthless. After all, what good is free speech when you're struggling for housing and shelter, let alone education to think with, medicine, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And that's at best. At worst, you get the basically crypto fascists who understand that free market unregulated capitalism is never going to provide those things. And actually, they're just using libertarianism and all of this rhetoric about freedom and liberty, which, as I've said in other videos, are not really useful concepts in the abstract. It is freedom in relation to something else. It's liberty in relation to something else, not just this universal timeless concept, but in struggle against a particular thing that is significantly more meaningful in any kind of a useful way. Uh, they use all this rhetoric basically to fuel the libertarian to fascist pipeline. This is a real thing. You can see it all over social media. Libertarians insisting up, down, and sideways that they're not right-wingers when everything they do is far right. Or then you get the other sort of like Nazis were actually left-wing, blah, blah, blah. We're not racist because racism is a form of collectivism and we don't even recognize race. And anyway, every other piece of nonsense you've ever heard. So again, not big on libertarianism to say the least. And as promised, we're now going to turn to a video from the Jimmy Dore show in which Jimmy talks to libertarian Max Kaiser about Bitcoin, which Max Kaiser is going to promote heavily and give a whole bunch of libertarian framed reasons why Bitcoin, which of course is a very popular thing among libertarians. I was asked by a viewer to respond to this video. Um, I'm not an economist. I just, um, while I understand economics reasonably well, and I do study Marx, it's just not a subject I'm hugely passionate about. Uh, libertarians, though, they have this kind of fallacy that like only they understand economics when in fact they sell a completely bullshit, mystified version of economics that oftentimes is just flat out lying about its data. So anyway, I did uh, watch this video and I thought, yeah, we can uh, we can take a crack at this. So Jimmy Dore, of course, for background, um, I did a video on Jimmy Dore when he had that Boogaloo boy on. The whole Boogaloo thing, even if it's well-intentioned, which I don't think most of the Boogaloo boys are well-intentioned, but to the extent that there even are a few well-intentioned Boogaloo boys, it's a bad fucking idea. And the way that Jimmy... Do the, the main criticism that I had was the way that Jimmy Dore was uncritically waxing this guy's butt. I mean, just really... Everything that this guy said was just gold. Jimmy was like, wow, I can't believe how wonderful everything you're saying is. And he kind of does the exact same thing here to another libertarian pushing Bitcoin. Now, is it a coincidence? Some people say, you know, well, Jimmy's just sort of whatever the excuse is when Jimmy thinks there's something in it for him, whether it's his petty bourgeois capitalist leaning politics or whether he thinks he's going to get a show on RT someday, whatever it is, he is clearly willing to embrace libertarian, anti-socialist, anti-Marxist, anti-communist politics. I mean, he seems eager to do it at, at the first chance. And we do know libertarians being capitalists, they've got some money to throw around. Hey, might as well pick up some of that change, right, Jimmy? Now that's change you can believe in. Anyway, you know... I'm not doing this video specifically to bash Jimmy Dore, but I've had people tell me Jimmy's a Marxist. No, he's fucking not. 
the Libertarian Party was founded for the express goal of promoting unregulated free market capitalism. There's nothing remotely Marxist about that. And plugging libertarians, especially as uncritically, without very much nuance at all, as he does, that's a huge problem. And I know people are desperate for leaders and something to believe in. I, I, I hear that. Things are dire. We want to believe that some of these large channels are looking out for us. I just don't think that we can actually, you know, abandon what's right in front of our faces. Speaking of, let's watch the video. I'm going to play the whole thing and comment. Here we go. Very pleased to have our next guest with us. He's hosted business and economic programs on the BBC and Al Jazeera. He currently hosts the incredibly popular The Kaiser Report on RT. It's our guest, Max Kaiser. Thanks for coming on, Max. Oh, Jimmy Dore, this is a dream come true. I'm so happy to be here with you, finally. This is exciting. <laughs> okay. Now, um, I wanted to show this because uh, it says Max Kaiser Bitcoin to hit $220,000 in 2021 as per hash rate adjustments. Now, Lala, let's just start talking about so that's quite a prediction, and it made me go out, go out and buy some Bitcoin, actually. So I'm listening to you, and go ahead. Tell me what I need to know about Bitcoin. <laughs> the first thing you need to know about Bitcoin is that it's fuck you money. Interesting jumping off point. First of all, is Max Kaiser doing a voice, or is he going through puberty? Anyway, um, so, quote, Bitcoin is fuck you money. This is, you know, big, you can't make me clean my room energy. This is one of the, you know, intelligence insulting, uh, demeaning and condescending pitches that libertarians make. It's you can't control me. You can't tell me what to do. I'm against the state. Meh, meh, meh. I'm for freedom. Meh, 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 meh. So he will say that line over and over again. It's fuck you money. It's like basically some 80s ad campaign playing on Teenage Rebellion. Um, you know, w w what a pitch. Hey, we're antisocial. <laughs> okay. I mean, you know, there are people for whom that's appealing. They think, hey, I'm a dick. How can I get my hands on some dick money? Well, here's how. Uh, it's unconfiscatable. And um, you don't need a bank to transact with it. And the state can't take it away. Let me just say, those are not huge problems that I've been having in my life. Most of the social problems I can identify have nothing to do with any of the things he just mentioned. Maybe if I was some multimillionaire capitalist bad boy, those would be my problems. And, you know, if you are, I'm sorry that you're having problems. You're also a tiny minority of the population, and most people couldn't give less of a fuck. But, here we are, Jimmy Dore, promoting those concerns to his not inconsiderable audience. And that's why it's a human rights issue. That's why people around the world are getting into Bitcoin, because they, they want to be able to separate state from money. Uh, no. So, like I said, the social problems I see, not traced to this at all. He then goes on to call it a human rights issue. That's fucking offensive is what it is. And, you know, people are trying to separate money from the state. Who, who does this guy speak for? Like, that's actually not a major fight I hear anyone but libertarians making. I don't talk to working people ever and hear them say, if only we could separate money from the state. Ever. Not once. Not once. But you've got to be familiar with the cult of libertarianism to like even understand this long twisted thought process that they have gone down. He will rail against central banks quite a bit in this video. Uh, this is something libertarians hate in a nutshell. Libertarians want to go back before the founding of the new deal and the federal reserve and all of the federal programs that the U S government, I mean, in many of the capitalist imperialist countries set up, in the early 20th century. Libertarians want to go back to robber baron style capitalism before any of that stuff. They blame central banks for every problem you could name. It's an extremely limited concept of, you know, 
the relationship between society and economics. They're, again, not anti-capitalist. They're incredibly uh, strong proponents of capitalism. And anything that you can show tying capitalism to a social problem, they will just dismiss it and say, no, it's the state, it's the state, it's the state. In their minds, they are still fighting against the monarchy like it's 1776. Uh, society has moved on. Technology has moved on. The class composition of society is completely different now than it was when the bourgeois revolutions are happening. If you look at the libertarian platform, it is, I mean, largely copied and pasted from founding documents of the United States. They're extremely out of date. Society is engaged in a different stage of history right now. The mode of production is more advanced. Things are different. And, um, you know, they, they will try to cast any problem in terms of state versus individual. That's simply not how it works. Let's continue. And that's never happened before in history until Bitcoin. Again, not true. Look up the Liberty Dollar Bernard von Nothaus, who was tapped by 2004 presidential candidate for the Libertarian Party, Michael Bednarik, to be, I believe, his Treasury Secretary. This is basically an effort to make a silver-based currency that would um, you know, replace the U.S. dollar. They have been at these kinds of schemes for a while. It's just that now they have the technology to do Bitcoin, which I guess they didn't have in 2004. But uh, actually, the Liberty Dollar got raided by the U.S. government because they said they were trying to uh, more or less impersonate U.S. currency. So um, we're not here to debate all the merits of that case right now. But to say that Bitcoin is the first attempt to do this is absolutely not true. So that's not a great uh, jumping off point again. And that's very important, especially... It, we're in a, a stage now where in the U.S. and around the world, countries are just printing trillions and trillions of dollars and euros and, and yen. And so the value of that fiat money is going down. And you can see it uh, in terms of your purchasing power, right? It translates into inflation, right? Prices are going up, uh, certainly in education, healthcare, and housing the last 10 years. Those, those things have gone up incredibly, 200% in the case of education. And that's all the result of all this money printing. So again, this is classic libertarian rants against the central banks and fiat money and inflation and et cetera. These are just standard libertarian talking points that don't really address any of the fundamental contradictions of capitalism. They just say, we did it better prior to the 20th century. That isn't true, and there's no way to go back to that, even if you wanted to. Also, the claim that he just made, all of this is solely, he admitted the solely, but it's implied, due to inflation, he doesn't make that case at all. So, again, we need to provide reason and evidence for our claims. He does not do that. Jimmy just lets him pass all of this stuff off as though it were 100% true, no emissions, you know, he's not neglecting to consider other angles, etc. So what, what people are figuring out is that they need to escape all of this money printing and they're going into Bitcoin because uh, it's hard money, it, there's a finite supply and the, just all money managers, individuals, corporations are now figuring out that the only way to you know, prevent them, their own uh, net worths from being printed to death is they have to own have to own Bitcoin. All right. And then par for the course, here is an utterly lazy appeal to authority argument uh, that has no evidence behind it whatsoever. Just, oh, yeah. And lots of people who are really smart and know what they're doing are going for Bitcoin because of blah, blah, blah. So this would probably be a good place before he gets in, you know, before we get into the weeds anymore with what he's saying, to talk about Bitcoin from a socialist perspective. What is it? He mentioned their hard money. That would be the opposite of fiat currency to libertarians. They're all about the hard money. For a while, they wanted to go back to the gold standard. Or was it the silver standard? Like, they couldn't make up their mind, depending on who you talk to. 
Um, but they're all about this like finite money supply and that's going to fix all the problems. It, of course, isn't. And really, these people, again, are just another faction of capitalists. People have large amounts of money and are trying to protect that capital. It doesn't really have anything to do with the interests of workers. But let's get into Bitcoin. I personally discarded the libertarian hard money analysis. And I mean, there's quite a fervor over that in the libertarian world years ago. And personally, I haven't really reapproached the topic since that time. So a lot of this stuff is not super fresh to me. I only remember spending an intense amount of time thinking and writing about it about 15 years ago, at which point I eventually reached a point where I said, wow, this is a terrible idea. Let's just leave it alone. And I've just not really, uh, like I said, reapproached the topic since that time. I do want to read an article, which I think sums up a lot of the issues pretty well by Yanis Varoufakis called Why Bitcoin is Not a Socialist's Ally, Reply to Ben Ark. This is from last year, July 27, 2020. On 15th July, Ben Ark published in Bitcoin Magazine an open letter addressed to me in a bid to convince me that I should reassess my rejection of Bitcoin as a force for good, as a bulwark for democratizing capitalism, okay, and paving the ground for socialism. Here is my reply. Dear Ben Ark, thank you for your open letter and your efforts to bring a socialist perspective to bear upon my assessment of Bitcoin. In my reply below, I shall address you as a fellow socialist, rather than put together a reply meant to address all sorts of different perspectives, e.g. Keynesian, Hayekian, neoclassical. As you know, I am one of those who, back in 2011, were genuinely intrigued, fascinated even by the remarkable blockchain algorithm. The prospect of a decentralized ledger controlled by its community of users was mesmerizing. As you also know, I was unimpressed by Bitcoin as an alternative to fiat money that is either likely or indeed desirable under our current capitalist predicament. Having read your open letter, I remain as enthusiastic on blockchain's capacities and as unimpressed by Bitcoin's ability to help us either civilize or, as any socialist dreams of, transcend capitalism. Two propositions support this view. In the hypothetical case where Bitcoin were, under presently existing capitalism, to replace fiat money, one, it would lack the mechanism necessary to stop capitalist crises from yielding depressions that benefit only the ultra-right, i.e. ultra-rich, and two, its community-based democratic protocols would do little to democratize economic life. I shall explain my two propositions briefly below, but before you despair at my continued negative take on Bitcoin, let me foreshadow the concluding sentence in the epilogue below. Once, and of course, if socialism dawns, money will have to be founded on a distributed ledger, monetary commons-enabling technology. In other words, I shall argue that Bitcoin is not fit for purpose under capitalism or as a vehicle toward transcending capitalism, but something like Bitcoin will characterize monetary systems in a future world free of private banks and share markets. Okay, let me support my two propositions. Proposition 1. Bitcoin lacks the shock absorbers necessary to prevent capitalist crises from doing untold damage to the working class. Consider the crash of 08 or the more recent 2020 COVID-19 induced crisis. Suppose that central banks didn't have the capacity instantly to create trillions of dollars, euros, pounds, and yen, and instead had to rely on a spontaneous majority of Bitcoin's users to agree to a massive increase in the supply of money. The result would be a 1929-like collapse of banks and corporations. While socialists would shed no tears for the tragedy of the oligarchy, Socialists should beware that a 1929-like systemic collapse is bound to strengthen the forces of the ultra-right, not of the socialist left, which has been, since at least 1991, languishing in the doldrums of political paralysis. Technically, there is of course nothing that would prevent the Bitcoin community from agreeing instantly to even a doubling of the money base. However, the tragedy of the commons guarantees that Bitcoin owners will be subject to the usual prisoner's dilemma dynamic that prevents the boost in the money supply necessary to avert the liquidation of potentially viable businesses and jobs. Moreover, this free rider problem is made far, far worse by the fact that Bitcoin ownership 
is very unequally distributed, thus giving the Bitcoin-rich powerful incentives to restrain the growth of the money supply, since such restrictions would boost their private rents at the expense of the public interest. In short, the free rider problem that guarantees the maximal reinforcement of any capitalist crisis in any economy relying on Bitcoin as its main currency will be turbocharged by the unequal ownership of Bitcoin, which is unavoidable in any monetary system overlaid upon contemporary capitalism. Proposition 2. Under capitalism, Bitcoin's dominance will not democratize economic life or give socialism a chance. Suppose again that some magic wand is waved and Bitcoin replaces fiat money under contemporary capitalist conditions. In other words, as Bitcoin replaced dollars, pounds, euros, and yen, property rights over land, resources, and machines remain as they are, while private equity firms and pension funds continue to own the bulk of shares trading in Wall Street, the city, etc. All that will have changed is that central banks will vanish, and the community of Bitcoin users will determine the global money supply, which is subject to the free rider problems mentioned above. Very few people disproportionately own large shares of Bitcoin. At the firm level, nothing will have changed. Jeff Bezos will still control a massive monopsony come monopoly. Facebook will still own the whole marketplace within its platform. ExxonMobil will continue to lean on weaker developing country governments to drill for oil and gas that should be left in the earth, etc. And what of private banks? They would, make no mistake here, find ways of creating complex derivatives based on Bitcoin. Derivatives that will soon, just like Lehman Brothers CDOs prior to 2008, function as stores of value and means of exchange, i.e. as private money. Massive bubbles denominated in Bitcoin will build up and they will burst just as they did in the 19th century under the gold standard. That was prior to the Federal Reserve and all the stuff libertarians complain about. And then, in the absence of central banks and with the Bitcoin community in the clasps of the aforementioned free rider problem, depression will follow, as it did before the Fed was instituted in the U.S. Thus, the tragedy mentioned in Proposition 1 above kicks in. In short, not only will the democratization of money via Bitcoin fail to democratize capitalism, but it will also give an almighty boost to the forces of regression. Epilogue Bitcoin's great appeal is that it breaks the cronious chain linking central banks and private bankers. However, it does not undermine the cronyism of the network of bosses, politicians, and private bankers. Lest we forget, 19th century bimetallic America, that was gold and silver standard, also lacked a central bank. Under the gold and silver standards, the public money supply was fixed and could not be easily manipulated by the state, either the government or the then non-existent Fed. But that didn't stop private bankers from leveraging public money out of thin air to create huge quantities of private money with which to fund the robber barons, i.e. the Jeff Bezoses of the era. In this sense, replacing fiat money with Bitcoin would take us back to a postmodern version of 19th century America, not exactly a prospect socialists should go to the barricades for. In summary, the monetary system is like the dog's tail. It cannot wag the capitalist dog, in the sense that democratizing money by means of a monetary commons will not democratize economic life, but rather make capitalism uglier, nastier, and more dangerous for humanity, comment that's a good summary of libertarianism. Having said all this, a monetary commons that may very well rely on something like the blockchain underpinning Bitcoin will, I have no doubt, be an essential aspect of a democratized economy of socialism. That's the end of the article. And, I, you know, I don't know about that last statement, but that article does sum up some of the basic problems with the, I think, very short-sighted libertarian philosophy. I would also, not going to read the whole thing, but would like to point you to another article titled Bitcoin, Utopian Reflection of a Capitalist Nightmare by Ben Gliniecki. And I will just read the beginning quickly and we'll get back to the video. It says, The digital currency Bitcoin has hit the headlines in recent times for its novelty as well as its phenomenal rise in price. That is what Jimmy Dore is talking about over the past few years. But how much of the sensation is hype and what is the reality? Bitcoin is a method of payment and a digital currency that was launched in 2009. It has been described as cash for the internet, 
and the price of all bitcoins in circulation currently amounts to 1.5 billion US dollars. One of its key features is its decentralized structure that prevents regulation of the currency by a central authority or bank. It is this aspect of Bitcoin that is trumpeted by utopian libertarians who see it as the embryo of capitalism without regulation or control, a dream that is already being scuppered by the realities of the modern world. Others see Bitcoin simply as an opportunity to get rich quick and then get out before the bubble bursts, and in that sense, Bitcoin paints a microcosmic picture of the nightmarish, short-termism, and irresponsibility that is the hallmark of capitalism in decline. Comment, I agree. They're trying to just line their pockets. Everybody sees the system as falling apart, and they're trying to just line their pockets while they can. It is hardly surprising that such a phenomenon should take off in the midst of a global crisis of capitalism. So I'm going to link to both of these articles in the video description. I particularly recommend this second one, which, again, I don't have time to read right now. I want to get back to the video without making this three hours long. Um, but they go into excruciating detail into all the areas in my brain that are somewhat dusty. You know, like I said, I dealt with this libertarian nonsense about 15 years ago, put it to rest, haven't really taken it out of the mental closet since then. This article does a good job of breaking down why this basically is a get rich quick scheme that's never going to fully replace currency. Um, it's not something that people use to pay taxes with. It's not tied to the real value of other commodities. It's not backed by the faith and credit of a national economy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So most likely it will remain as a speculative hedge um, and the hype is hype. But I do recommend that article for some of the nitty gritty. I think they did a great job breaking that down. Now let's get back to Max Kaiser. He's about to run through every predictable you know, talking point you could possibly think up, and Jimmy Dore is going to just gulp it all down. So that's that's kind of my first salvo into the Bitcoin universe, Jimmy. <laughs> so so let me ask you now, what's the difference between buying Bitcoin and buying gold? Because I was told that Bitcoin was invented as an actual uh, currency, but no one actually uses it to buy or sell things except they use it to like as if you were going to buy gold, right? So tell me what's the difference between buying a Bitcoin and buying gold as a hedge? Well, Bitcoin really was invented as a protest uh, back in 2008 and 2009 uh, as a protest against the central banks and against um, everything that's going wrong with the central banks. And So a big problem we have within the left, within socialism, within the more conscious working class is getting co-opted by liberals of various stripes, not just left liberal Democrats, but by anyone promoting some version of capitalism, which they portray as being different from the status quo, superior, more enlightened, etc. It's exactly what he's doing here. It's no one in 2008 was talking about the problems of the central banks. That wasn't the fucking problem. The problem is capitalism itself. And tolerating people like this, diverting people's outrage onto the central banks, helps capitalists, particularly you know the libertarian persuasion. It doesn't help working people. Jimmy lets him get away with it. Fiat money. So it's a protest against fiat money. Now, when you compare it to gold, uh, it's similar to gold because it uh, it's sensitive to inflation and you can hold on to your wealth with with gold and Bitcoin. But what's turned out to be the case is that Bitcoin is superior to gold. All the attributes that people associate with gold are equal with Bitcoin, but much better. For example, and the millennials are hot on Bitcoin because they it's really the the the, the currency of the millennial generation. Uh, they they have a horrible hand that was dealt to them. You know, they came of age during 9-11 when they were kids. Then they went through the 2008 crisis. Their trust in the system is at absolute rock bottom. So what he's doing is what infuriates me about libertarians. The success of libertarians through the 2000s was piggybacking off of other movements, which are actually based in reality, whether it's the anti-war movement or the 9-11 truth movement, which many people today associate with right-wing libertarians because they so 
thoroughly wormed their way into it. 9-11, I participated in that. To me, 9-11 was clearly a right-wing plot to generate a pretext for imperialist wars of aggression in the Middle East and Central Asia. Clearly, uh, there's no real good evidence for the official version. And libertarians came over and they tried to just make it an issue, not about class and not about imperialism, but just about government and, you know, centralized power. And they do this all the time. They try to reduce class consciousness, reduce social consciousness, and just peddle these narratives of like universal, timeless things divorced from social context, divorced from anti-capitalist analysis, and so on. That's exactly what he's doing here. He's also doing more of the, uh, oh, it's like cyber gold. It's like the kids love it. And, you know, it's uh, you can play with it on your iPod or whatever. I mean, it's so condescending what they do, but they have been successful because a lot of people just don't have the education to push back on this. And that is really sad and a travesty because these people are in some ways the ultimate predators. They want a system where you're not protected at all. You either have capital or you are fucked. Like those are the options in libertarianism. You know, for as much as we socialists complain about social democracy, some of those reforms were useful. It was a little harder to be brutalized to the utmost extent under social democracy. You know, oh, yes, it was still fueled by imperialism, but there, there were some worker rights. That's the point. And uh, fuck, man, they want to make the whole world just into the green zone where the capitalists live and then utter chaos where the rest of us have to live. That's what's uh, coming. And, and of course, it will be policed heavily because how else are they going to hang on to their private property? Anyway, this I find so appalling when libertarians start worming their way in to discussions like these in exactly the way that he's doing and watch Jimmy Dore not push back. And so they figured out that Bitcoin is this fuck you money. They're saying, you know what? I need my fuck you money, fuck politics, fuck the media, fuck money printing, fuck gold, because gold is not portable, it's not divisible, it's not even that scarce. So there's a lot of problems with gold, and, and Bitcoin solves all those problems, and it's 10 times better than fiat money. So this is why it's over, worth over. Look at all the tells, all the fidgeting, all the twitching with his, you know, playing with his ears and everything. He knows what he's saying is a complete bald-faced lie these people are so despicable and again is jimmy gonna push back what he's saying this is not good for you and that's the lie and he just sits here and he knows he's lying that's all the tells are coming from you know jimmy Dore prides himself on being this world-class bullshit detector well where is it over a trillion dollars on kaiser report we started talking about it when it was a dollar back in 2011. And as journalists traveling around the world, you know, we're always sensitive to the fact that we're in danger zones or we're in the middle of riots or we're crossing borders or we're in foreign territories. And we, when Bitcoin came around, we, we figured out, you know, this is unconfiscatable money uh, that will we as a safety for us, you know, in case we need to get out of a tight situation, you know, this is a great this is a great asset to have uh, plus for, for a lot of other reasons. But so and when you compare it to gold, um, you find that it's superior in many ways. And that's why a lot of people are suggesting, Jimmy, that th the price of gold has not been really moving at all this year for the past eight or nine months because people are dumping gold and buying Bitcoin is actually grabbing market share away from Bitcoin. If you look at the total market capitalization of gold, it's roughly 10, 11 trillion dollars. Uh, Bitcoin is just over a trillion. So one of the targets the Bitcoin community has is for the market cap of Bitcoin to equal and then exceed gold. So that would take us from 50,000 where Bitcoin is now to 500,000. Uh, in the next, you know, I think in the next two or three years, we're going to see that uh, because people are dumping their gold and buying Bitcoin. 
because it's a better store of value. And it's now 100 million people are using Bitcoin around the world. It is also being used as, as a currency as well. But as a store of value, it's proving itself to be superior to anything else. So um, what you don't think that the... Do you th so if this is, it seems to me that the powers that be, I, I, I always think back to that uh, scene uh, with Ned Beatty in uh, in network where he says you have messed with the you know global money and you have to you will atone. So these guys who have made up this Bitcoin aren't they going to be made to atone because they're messing with the Saudis' money? They're messing with the petrodollar. They're messing with Wall Street. They're messing with so they're messing with everybody. Aren't they going to be made to atone? And aren't they going to take all your Bitcoin money away from you? Well, this is the beautiful thing about Bitcoin. It's uh, impenetrable. The, the the shield, if you will, the encrypted shield is um, it, it can it cannot be attacked. It's it's similar to BitTorrent. You know, BitTorrent, which you use to swap uh, digital files online. Uh, Hollywood and record industry would have loved to take down BitTorrent, but because it's replicated on so many servers all over the world and it's encrypted, you can never take down BitTorrent. Uh, Bitcoin is the same thing, but for money. It's replicated on all these servers all over the world. It's encrypted. You can't break the encryption. And um, so there's no way to attack it. Uh, the, the governments would, have, would love to. Uh, so far, some governments have banned it. But people have said, fuck you. Again, it's fuck you money in India, Nigeria, China. Uh, around the world. People are saying, hey, fuck you. We're going to trade Bitcoin between us. You can't stop us. It's uncensorable. It's unconfiscatable. So there's no way to attack it. Um, and this is why it's challenging the central banks and the whole model of central banks. And this is why it's important for progressives, I think, in America. Because Okay, finally, something to comment on. I apologize for the long stretch. There just was not a lot of content in there for me to comment on. Now, he just said something, which is, well, it's important for the progressives. Boom. And I had to pause it because here you see again, where is the libertarian progressive alliance clamor coming from? Is it coming from progressives? Is it coming from socialists? Is it coming from people on the left? No, it's fucking not. It's coming from libertarians whose whole fucking purpose in life is to co-opt and parasitize other movements. That's what they do. They co-opt other things. Just like capitalists commodify the use value that you produced, this is what they do. They walk over and they try to, you know, co-opt your energy into their movement for their personal gain. So what he's talking about there, yes, uh, most countries either treat Bitcoin like a private money or they ban it outright. China has banned it. Good move. I mean, honestly, like, why would you want this stuff? It is, I mean, it, but it's like gold also. Um, okay, you know, people at various times have or haven't been allowed to own gold, etc. This really isn't an issue for progressives. We're fighting for people who have nothing, not who can't decide, you know, where to put their capital or who feel that, you know, their vast um, wealth is being damaged by inflation. We're fighting for the people who live on the street or live in a small apartment or, you know, live in a little house or whatever. We barely have anything. All we really can do is work every day for a living. And we're fighting for those people, not for whatever the fuck he's talking about. And, um... You know, uh, you, listener in the audience there, you listening to this very show, what do you think? Have you bought Bitcoin? Has it changed your life? Do you see this as a way forward to some kind of progressive or socialist change? What has it done for you? Uh, I have never owned Bitcoin. I've never owned gold. That's just not like my orientation in life is, you know, where do I put my vast amounts of wealth? Because I don't have any. That's not my class concern. So let's see where he's going with this, why progressives need to care. Because so many of the issues that people are talking about now, the stimulus checks and everything else, you know, are important to, to understand that all that money printing, all it does is it helps the, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. 
You know, that's interesting because I'm pretty sure actually a lot of that money helped people from starving, including many children, you know, uh, avoiding eviction or foreclosure. This guy is a complete lying scumbag. So he's like, oh, yeah, well, you know, you actually don't want that money because the rich are getting richer. Uh, no, douchebag. I think that's actually what you're whining about right now is exactly the opposite, that people who have money, um, the money supply is being diluted, et cetera. When you print money, it's never distributed in a way that doesn't hurt the bottom that's and true. help the top. That's it's true. called a cantillon effect. Wow. So look at Jimmy Dore nodding his head. And like smiling, like he just said the most obvious, you know, truth they don't want you to know in the world. Jimmy Dore, who regularly rails, I guess, because it connects with his audience about, you know, how the U.S. is failing to give people enough money. And now he's sitting here like, yes, yes. What a snake. So, well, which is it, Jimmy? Like, what is your true belief? Is it do you actually believe what he's saying or do you actually believe that the government should have been? giving people more money because the two are in direct conflict. That's the kind of the economic phrase of it, the term. But but it's is that it's is that really whoever not gets helping. Go ahead. Is that whoever gets the money first has the greatest advantage? That's the cantillion effect. Yeah, it's, it's the distribution of the money. So, so it'll go to the, it goes to essentially the banks first and then the banks will buy real estate and put it on their balance sheet. OK, and then they'll lend it out. Yes. And then it'll the balance sheet will go up and then they use that as collateral to go buy more property. And it's uh, it, it, it never the all the money printing is not it's going to hurt people. It's not. OK, it's actually kind of hard to keep up with how blatantly dishonest what he just said was. So, yes, the system is the central bank makes the money, then it goes to the private banks, and from there, that's where it gets into the economy for the most part. Um, and then he's complaining that because they, those banks get first crack at the borrowing, they then can you know, go buy property and things like that, and then they personally benefit. Well, there's a simple solution to that called regulating what they can do with the money. Oh, but you're a libertarian, and you're against any kind of regulation at all. It's, it's like astounding the level of deceit being practiced in this interview. And Jimmy Dore just is lapping it up. He can't get enough of it. You know, when you get in bed with libertarians, you're at the fucking bottom of your political career. It, you can't actually go much lower. These people are a joke. And Lib uh, Jimmy Dore and libertarians, I mean, it's a regular thing now going to help people. So, the 1.9 trillion is going to end up reducing purchasing power. So you, 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 minimum wage increase will end up reducing purchasing power. There it is. Little shot at the minimum wage. I hope he gets in child labor and pollution laws soon. It, it, that, the, so this, the problem is not the amount of money. The problem is the money. Is the money. Is the dollar. That fiat money. That's the problem. And uh, it's... I, I, what? He himself seems to be fumbling there. He's uh, stammering a little bit. Um, well, you just actually made a good case for why the problem is the amount of money. And now you're saying it's not. I mean, even Bitcoin, the owners of Bitcoin could agree to increase the amount of Bitcoins. They could do that. Um, I'm a little perplexed here. But, and again, you know, I, I feel like uh, what I just said about regulating what the banks can do... Obviously, that's a solution within capitalism. It's infuriating dealing with libertarians because, like, even from a capitalist perspective, we've already um, solved these problems years ago. Like, even within capitalism, like, capitalism moved to a higher level. It's kind of crazy. Like, they might as well be, you know, advocating for the return of the monarchy. And in fact, many people do consider libertarians a sort of neo feudalist. Um, in that it's so reactionary, it's like moving that far backwards and would empower capitalists, you know, as much as sort of feudal lords were, be that much of a step back to the past. Um, yeah, so it, it's the amount of money or it's the dollar or it's the dollar because the dollar, the amount of dollars can be changed by the government and the central banks are like, what is the problem? And is Jimmy Dore going to put his foot down? at any point in time. And for folks telling me that Jimmy Dore is a Marxist, please, what do you have to say to this? I mean, again, I'm like stooping to the level here of like arguing 
about how capitalists even found ways around the problems that this guy is talking about. It's this is such a far cry from socialism. It's ridiculous. It's taking me out of socialism. I mean, it's pulling me that far back. Let's again keep in mind all of the problems with capitalism that he's trying to prey on here to initiate a worse version of capitalism. The solution is revolution. We need to end capitalism and we will end all of this instability along with it. Just another way to look at it, Jimmy, is that you have to look at it in this way. In terms of interest rates. All right, let's look at In terms of what now? That was a very long stall. <laughs> let's see what he turns it into. What did Mr. Kaiser come up with there while all he was doing all that searching upstairs? Interest rates for a second. So interest rates are uh, they vary from zero to 18% on credit cards and then thousands of percentage on payday loans. So one of the ways that m printing money helps the top one tenth of 1% is that they have that access to that 0% interest rate. Yes. So I skipped ahead. He goes on for like a while on this subject. It doesn't actually seem, he doesn't make a clear connection between this and what he was talking about before. He was talking about getting the money first. Okay, he, he's not making explicit the connection between the low interest rate and getting it first. So we have to, again, when you're critically evaluating someone else's argument, you don't want to fill in the gaps for them because you can wind up just projecting, you know, being overly charitable in what they're saying. And you can wind up um, falling into a trap of what they're saying because you, you know, they left the door open and, and you wandered in and, uh, you know, <laughs> there's not necessarily anything in there for you. Um, he didn't make that clear. So we need to do a little bit of guesswork Again, this is hypothetical about exactly what he's talking about. But to just address this on a really basic level, the more capital you have, like the easier, well, you have a lot more collateral for one thing. And if you have established um, financial you know, success or like success at managing uh, profitable capitalist enterprises, then of course... Um, you're going to get better deals from financial capitalists lending you money. Is this um, something specific to the central banks? He's not super clear on the subject. And again, I don't want to hand him something that he didn't earn here in terms of his rhetoric and his argumentation. Um, but yeah, this is, I mean, no matter what, <laughs> whether you're on a gold standard or whatever, um, bigger capitalists are going to get bigger deals. That's part of like to turn it around the uh the hidden costs of poverty you can't buy anything in bulk you have to buy everything individually and therefore you never get volume discounts you never get the good deals etc so it actually costs more to be poor um is that what he's talking about i'm not totally sure let's proceed whereas everybody else pays 18 percent on a credit card or higher so th and what you can do with a zero percent interest rate which is essentially free money is you can go buy an asset that's producing income, like a company or some other business, and then use the income to leverage to go borrow more money at 0%. That's why wealth is concentrating so spectacularly at the very top, because their cost of money is zero. I'll give you a great example. Um, you have in Europe, for example, uh, Louis Vuitton, LVMH, the luxury brand company. They recently bought Tiffany's, the American jewelry shop company, uh, they got a loan from the European Central Bank for 0%. So the central bank lent a private company, a multi-billion dollar company, to buy another billion dollar enterprise for free. Absolutely for free. So now this huge company has a, another huge piece of their business, and they didn't pay a penny for it. Right. Um, okay, so this is a little confusing. It almost sounds like he's arguing against capitalism in places. This is... You know, when libertarians really start to reach, you never know exactly what they're going to grab at. But uh, first of all, the scenario he's describing, I mean, they're borrowing the money for free. It's not that they don't have to pay back the money they've borrowed. They just don't have to pay interest on the loan. Like they don't have to pay, you know, a percentage to like just borrow the money. They still have to pay back the loan. <laughs> so like, what's that about? Um 
in as far as you know is he arguing against capitalism it's like yeah dude that's how capitalism works companies buy other companies and when you get to the point where that you're big enough and have enough capital that you can like leverage deal where you purchase a profitable company that you don't even really have to worry you just have, kind of have to like manage it along where it's at whereas you and i being proletarians you the listener not you and i max kaiser uh, don't have the capital to go buy the Tiffany's jewelry company. I mean, that's fucking capitalism. Are you against it now? Like, what is the deal? This makes absolutely no sense. Also, just like a minor point, most people don't buy businesses on their credit card at 18%. Just want to throw that out there. Take a look at uh, Amazon bought Whole Foods. The cost of that acquisition was nothing. And the, 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 the day after they bought it, earnings from Whole Foods went right to the bottom line. It's, it's accretive. They didn't have, there was no period when they have to absorb it into their balance sheet and figure out how, you know, no, it, they didn't pay any, they, they got it for nothing essentially. So this is why Warren Buffett is a billionaire because his cost of funds are zero. He can go out and buy companies all day long. He doesn't, he doesn't have to, he does not charge for those acquisitions and all the dividends and all, and all the income goes right to his bottom line. He himself has never had a, an, an idea in his life. He's never started a company. He's never built something. He's never, all he does is he just leeches on the banking system, gets his free money. And get this, Jimmy, when you have this access to 0% money and you can buy things for free, if you do make a mistake, guess what? You get bailed out. That's right. You get bailed out. So it's heads they win, tails we lose. Yeah. They, they can never lose. So there's Jimmy Dore's input on this whole situation. Quote, yeah. World-class bullshit detector, huh? He just let this guy spew complete drivel. Not an ounce of pushback. You really trust this analysis? in that situation. So interest rates are, are how are very screwed up. And uh, to take this a step further, the way that they sell this, this, this interest rate, what I call interest rate apartheid, right? If you Boy, he just can't stop. He really just can't stop. But this is classic white dude, libertarian, like right wing nonsense. That's really all you're listening to right now is libertarian, right-wing, white guy nonsense invoking apartheid to complain about the interest rates he's getting from his bank. What do you think? Because if you've got, if you're not getting a 0% interest, you're living in a Bantustan somewhere, you're paying 18% on your credit card just to eat, and you're starving, and, the, and you never get out of the 18% because you're 18% of the whole right from the get-go, and you never get over it. So you're oh, so you want to, I don't know, regulate credit card companies to rein in the power of finance capital? Doesn't sound very libertarian. No, of course that's not what you want to do. You think that magic coins that live in your computer are the answer in ways that you probably will never describe by the end of this interview, but you just want us to take that on faith. Just in debt perpetually. Meanwhile, you, this guy's borrowing at zero and just booking billions without any risk. So how does how does the government sell that? How does how do why do people buy this? We don't buy it. It's forced on us by right wing douchebags like you. We have been building movements for socialism for decades, which are always repressed, and people like you stand in our way. That's what happens. No one wants this but capitalists. No one does. There in fact has been organized resistance to this for a very long time. You, in fact, are talking about these issues, invoking all kinds of injustices, and then you're sidestepping the very obvious solutions. You're pointing people away from criticizing capitalism. You're pointing people away from the way out. You will speak against the way out. Socialism. So what he basically is describing there is under neoliberalism, when they decided to stop paying people in wages and have people just borrow money to live. I mean, people, of course, still get wages, but they're insufficient. And so they're like, here, you can just borrow the money to maintain your standard of living. Again, this started a few decades ago. David Harvey has done some great work talking about that particular topic. And he just invoked it, except he shies away from the obvious conclusion, which is that the people who have the money 
don't want to share it and are oppressing workers. That's not where he's uh, going with this. And meanwhile, Jimmy Dore is facilitating this entire presentation. And it has to do with the way that they talk about inflation. So the government says all day long that inflation is at between 1% and 2%. That's a lie. Inflation is really 10 to 12%. They don't count education, housing, and... Um, what? They don't, they don't include it. What? Don't I didn't know it. this. They don't include that in the inflation? They don't include it. No. No, no. They don't include it. If you were to include education, housing, and um, health care to, to in, in, the, in, in, in the way that people actually uh, are spending on those three items, the inflation would be 10 to 12 percent, would be reported 10 to 12 percent today. But they do not include those items when they tell us that it's one to two percent. So why do they lie? There's two major reasons. Number one, the cost of living adjustment. So, the, you know, the, your Social Security account is supposed to go up every year based on inflation. If they understate inflation, then they don't have to pay that extra. So they Now, I don't know what Max Kaiser's personal views on Social Security are, but I know that the Libertarian Party, for example, wants to completely privatize Social Security. So basically, if it's public anything, it's go if it's government anything, they don't want it. So when he's invoking this here, don't think he's on the side of increasing Social Security. Not at all. Uh, that would be my guess, because that is the default libertarian position and it is the official position of the party. We covered that when we went through Joe Jorgensen's campaign platform uh, back before the election last year. And meanwhile, Jimmy doesn't really know what the guy's talking about. It's a little bit sad, actually. They're ripping us off. The Social Security beneficiaries are being ripped off $72 billion a year just on that simple accounting fraud. But more importantly, the second reason why they don't why they lie about the true inflation number is because then they say, well, we need to create stimulus. We need to create inflation. So let's print money. OK, and then when they print money, <laughs> it, not, you know, all of it goes to the top who can borrow at zero percent because inflation is so low and everyone else is struggling because their purchasing power is crashing. That's how the machine works. That's how Wall Street and Washington are manipulating interest rates and the inflation numbers to create huge wealth concentration at the top and why everyone is essentially suffering and struggling and they can't make ends meet and life expectancy is declining and um, poverty rates are increasing and all, all those things are happening. Those two pivots, they misstate inflation. And um, they essentially allow for this, uh, these zero percent loans to take place. So uh, I have a theory uh, about so uh, no one I've had people on the show. I've asked them why what is in it for the United States government not to do what any other government is doing, that if they shut your business down due to covid, they pay this worker's salary or a great percentage of the worker's salary. And plus, they also give everyone health care like what? And, I, and so when when this covid started, when this pandemic started, I had Dylan Radigan on and he said that we're going to get a UBI and and Medicare for all. And I said, why would they do that? And he said, because there are no other they're out of options. Well, turns out they weren't. They could just screw everybody. And I'm like, so, and I keep asking, so what's in it to them? They're acting like it's, Chuck Schumer is acting like it's coming out of his pocket. Like, why does he care if we give people a $2,000 check? Why does he want to whittle it down? What's in it for him? And the no one has an answer. I'm going to ask you this, but my, the, here's my theory. I want to see what you say about it is that like what they did in 08, 09, the plan was not to help you keep your house. The plan was to make you lose your house because then they could give your house to Steve Mnuchin or the creditor, meaning Wall Street. So right now, they don't want you to be able to pay your mortgage. They don't want you to be able to pay your rent because if you can't pay your mortgage, then you, they get the house goes to the bank and they get to resell it. And if you can't pay your rent, maybe your landlord will lose his uh, apartment building. Same thing. It will go to the creditor, which is Wall Street. Is that too new? nefarious because it looks to me that's exactly what they're doing so i'm going to give a little bit of credit back to jimmy Dore because while he still has yet to push back well for reasons that i don't really understand i don't know if he doesn't understand what this guy is telling him or what the situation with that is but 
when he finally did just ask a lengthier question, it was framed in a way that was more consistent to, you know, something that was uh, positive, like worker friendly, like petty bourgeois friendly from the perspective of, you know, them being working people. Which it varies. You get some petty bourgeoisie who work, you know, alone or right alongside their workers while others, uh, you know, just own businesses and hire managers. So there is a little bit of a, you know, gradient there. But I'll give him a little bit of credit. It may be that some of the problems of pushback actually are more due to a stupidity problem, I guess. But, you know, I guess in that case, if you don't even understand what your guest is saying, why have these people on if you can't actually engage in discussion with them? So it's a problem either way. But anyway, while I do want to give a little credit back to him, I feel like what he just said really kind of goes against, without acknowledging that it goes against, what Max Kaiser has been saying. So I'm curious where Max Kaiser is going to go with this, because his whole thing is like, you can't just print money. It's like fucking Ron Paul is back, you know, chasing his pot of gold over the rainbow. Um, I don't know. There's a lot left to this interview. It feels to me really like it's going nowhere. Jimmy has been letting this guy just espouse uh, harmful libertarian policies. And then, you know, now we come to this crossroads of... I feel like Jimmy just didn't connect. Let's see. No, it's a bailout. It's another bailout, just like in 2008. When, so, the, so first of all, the cash that they're sending out, according to the way it's, the, the stipulations, they can be garnished. Yeah. So let's say you've yes. got a, a, the bank uh, has a lien on you for some reason, <laughs> yes. overdraft. Yes. You know, a lot of people have overdraft problems or they missed a payment or there's some, some other payment that's l hanging over them that immediately goes to pay for that. You can't protect it. So it just goes right through, right right back to where it came from, right back to the bank, number one. Number two, uh, the, the banks are technically insolvent. So they, they need to launder money through the so-called program, uh, whether it's MMT or universal basic income or um, COVID stimulus. All they're doing is laundering cash through the consumers that goes right back into the banking system so that they can, at the end of the quarter, show that they've uh, had money going through what is essentially an insolvent institution. They're creating demand for their services, even though the, the banks are technically insolvent. All that was a little hard to watch for me. Jimmy starts off looking confused when he goes, well, it's a bailout. He's like, my question was why they're not doing it. Um, and I was a little confused. And then he just goes on this thing. He says the banks are insolvent four times. But then he just describes the situation where the banks are owed money by people and they're going to get paid by the money that people are being paid because that's where people spend their money is repaying loans. I don't know why that qualifies as an insight rather than just describing something incredibly obvious that doesn't actually lead to any greater understanding. Like, yeah, that's how the economy works. The banks loan people money, like small businesses in particular, and then um, people have to repay that money. So what's his point? That giving people stimulus money means that they're going to meet their financial obligations and like that's the system i i don't that was supposed to i think be some like wry cynical observation and it just wasn't and yet jimmy Dore, who you know he starts off going like what you can see it on his face and then he's doing that like broad grin slow nodding thing I, you know, again, um, Jimmy doesn't come out of this looking awesome. And this guy just doesn't have that much of value to say. And then he's just going on about the banks, the banks, the banks. This is, I don't know, pretty typical libertarian stuff. And again, his solution is magic coins that live in your computer. I wonder if they're going to get back to that at some point. Because to me, the last five or so minutes of this interview has been fairly pointless. Okay, and on that note, I skipped ahead. They don't really talk about Bitcoin again, so I think this video is long enough. I'm going to leave it there. Um, I don't know what to say. You know, this isn't socialism. This isn't organizing for socialism. And, um, you know, like I said, I, I did this video as a suggestion from the audience, and 
this was another platform to denounce libertarianism and all that kind of thing. Let's get back to talking about socialism because that is really the matter at hand, not get-rich-quick schemes, no matter how they're dressed up as a protest against the empire or whatever else. Um, you know, the fact that this guy can even be misunderstood as some representative of the U.S. left really tells us that we have a lot of work to do. On that note, I am going to thank our current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. You can support us for as little as $2 a month. Everything helps and all donations are very encouraging. So thank you all. To everyone else, if you can spread this video, leave a like, comment, etc. All of that helps to spread the word about the channel. Thanks for listening and we will see you in the next one.